Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to a special Concordia conversation covering the ongoing situation and related deadly violence in Iran pertaining to human rights. Before we get into this important conversation between two experts that I'm so, so pleased are joining us today, allow me a few words about Concordia. First, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit, and membership based organization dedicated to strengthening the public private partnership ecosystem and how cross sector collaboration is used in pursuit of positive social impact and sustainable development goals. As a leading global convener and the host of the largest multi stakeholder event alongside the UN General Assembly each fall in New York, we know open, inclusive dialogue and diverse representation, um, to Tara's point that she made earlier, authentic representation is core to global progress. So today's conversation, which will be recorded and available for future viewing on the Concordia website and its YouTube channel, gets at the crux of that. Women's rights are human rights, and absent freedom of expression, a government cannot accurately represent the will of the people. What's happening in Iran right now has ramifications across the region and the world at the political, security, and economic levels. Even the World Cup is not immune from the geopolitical influence of what's happening. So our two experts today will discuss this further. And um, as a note, they'll also periodically be checking that chat feature, as this is a great space for our audience to be asking questions, adding its own analysis or thoughts or reactions, making this more of a conversation as well. So. Um, allow me to introduce. We have Hagar Hajar Shamali. She's the YouTube host and creator of Oh My World, and she's the CEO of Greenwich Media Strategies. Hagar is a news personality, political satirist, and creator, host, and the writer of Oh My World on YouTube. She's a foreign policy expert and is featured regularly as a national security analyst on MSNBC, CNN, BBC, Bloomberg, and Cheddar. I'll also note on Concordia's platforms. <laughs> Hagar is also CEO of Greenwich Media Strategies, which provides strategic communications consulting in the areas of national security, counter illicit finance, and business. And she's an adjunct professor at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. She's also a senior non resident fellow with the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center, um, in addition to being a Concordia advisor. Hagar is going to be joined by Tara Kangerlou. She's award-winning journalist, author of The Heartbeat of Iran, founder and president of Art of Hope, and she's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. As a global affairs journalist and the author of the award-winning book, The Heartbeat of Iran, she's captured the many complexities of life inside Iran and the many colorful stories of its people. Um, and she brings this also into her coursework at Georgetown. And as the founder of Art of Hope, which is one of the first nonprofit organizations that strictly focuses on trauma relief and mental health support for refugees, she's been a longtime engager with the Concordia space, um, leading in a variety of conversations throughout the years. Tar is born and was born and raised in Iran until her late teens, and she now lives between London and DC. So with those accolades out, it's my pleasure to welcome both Hagar and Tara to thank them in advance for what is surely going to be an insightful conversation um, and to encourage again our audience joining live to utilize that chat feature. Let's make this as dynamic as possible. Over to you, Hagar. Thank you so much, Hannah. It is so great to be here. I am so excited to be talking about this topic in particular because it's so important and so active and ongoing and so excited to talk about this with Tara of all people, um, given her own expertise, her background, um, and her personal familial background with Iran in particular. Um, Iran protests have been continuing since mid-September, and the Iranian regime has decided to respond with indiscriminate violence, resulting in the deaths of over 500 people, estimated, and an estimation of detaining 15,000 or over 15,000 people. These protests have been led by women, and they are ongoing across the country. And today I'm hoping what we can discuss is not just to the general aspects of these protests and, and how they look on the ground and what people are saying from the ground or, or um, what, uh, what makes them unprecedented, but also all the national security and other implications related to it, how the international community should respond, how people who want to support the Iranian protesters can, uh, what this means for the future of Iranian citizens and the future of the regime. And also definitely talking a little bit about what's going on at the World Cup because it's just remarkable. Uh, with that, before we start, I also wanna highlight for you Tara's book called The Heartbeat of Iran, which takes readers into the heart and soul of the country and looks at it not through the typical media or news related lens. 
I also want to point you to an article she recently published in Time called Why Iranian Protesters Chant Women, Woman, Life, Liberty. And you can find the relevant links in the Zoom chat as well. So, Tara, let's start with a general overview of what's going on on the ground in Iran. If you could just paint us a picture of how the protests look right now, what sparked them? I think many people know, but maybe if you could talk a little bit about Masa Amini, of course, and the importance um, her role, her death played in these protests, and what makes these protests different than past ones in Iran. Uh, thank you, Hagar, and um, to everyone at Concordia, Hannah, thanks for that kind introduction, and, and everyone who uh, quickly put this discussion together. Um, this is an unfolding and developing story, and um, as, as you asked um, and mentioned earlier, um, you know, what we're seeing in Iran started um, uh, after the death, uh, the tragic death of Mahsa Jina Amini in Iran on September 16, and, um, and, and just escalated into a nationwide protest Hager, that, that really encompasses all demands, all the demands of the Iranian society, 80 million of them to be exact. Um, you know, in, in many ways, demands are different, but, but at its core, they're the same, they're united and in unison, which is to defy the uh, didactic and autocratic uh, policy and governing system of the Islamic Republic, who has perpetually over the last 40 years defied uh, all aspects of civil, human, uh, political rights. Um, it has uh, uh, oppressed any form of free speech, free engagement, uh, civic engagement, and, um, and, and has held back women who, by the way, make up one of the most vibrant sectors of the society and have really put that on the forefront of its policy uh, to, to hold back women and, and their, uh, their role in the society. And we can talk about that. But again, what we're seeing in Iran moving into its 11th week is, is really the cry of ordinary Iranians whose hopes and dreams and aspirations and fears and, and, and dreams are similar to, uh, to that of ours and, and those who are viewing this conversation in the United States and around the world but are being held back by the policies of their regime. They are being held back from living to their full potential and um, in their cry for change, uh, they're, being, they're being brutally cracked down. I mean, as of yesterday, um, the death toll uh, as tallied by human rights activists based outside of Iran or in conversation with those inside the country have risen to over 450, including 63 children. And again, the extent of these numbers, we can never tell because we're not on the ground we're not you know reporting with with our own eyes but what we know that even just one life taken one person killed is too much in peaceful protests in it, at a time when people are just demanding uh, their the uh, to have their basic rights uh, but again iran has faced over the years a systematic uh, uh, oppression when it comes to their freedom of uh, of expression, their human rights, women's rights, um, and also, mind you, that they're living at an economically uh, devastated uh, country that's a result of, you know, of course, sanctions, but also the severe corruption, mismanagement of, of the regime. And we can talk about that, but again, this is a broken country that has so much more potential um, than, than what they've been uh, able to experience in the last uh, four decades. And now, you know, they have nothing to lose. As, as people have told me in Iran, they have nothing to lose. Uh, when, when people don't have the opportunity to dream hugger, it gets dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's when uh, all bets are off and, and, and they would do whatever it takes to, to regain that sense of hope. And that's what right. we're seeing on the streets. It's remarkable the fearlessness that we're seeing among among everybody. And it's and I, you know, you're right. If you you have to wonder what life must be like under the regime for someone to knowingly go out and protest, however they choose to protest, knowing that they will likely face violence, death, detention of some kind, um, and and against them and often their families. And it, so it's this fearlessness is remarkable. And I want to before before I 
get to the point, I want to ask you about, you know, whether Iranians can, whether this is a point of no return, given this barrier of fearlessness that's been broken. But before that, I want to harp a little bit, take one step back on the question of the mandatory hijab, because that is what sparked yes. these protests, right? And, and the Iranian regime is not a stranger to resistance against the mandatory hijab. Can you explain to everybody why the hijab, why the imposing it, making it obligatory, is so important to the regime and to the regime's repression and how that ended up unleashing this, this you know, intolerance toward the regime now. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was born uh, to, toward the end of the Iran-Iraq war. And, and when you look at the evolution of hijab in Iran, it has changed significantly. Right, the, the the sort of militarized uh, enforcement of the hijab in the early days of the revolution, then Iran Iraq War, and then uh, you know the few years after has has changed dramatically. You know, then it was during the Khatami era. You know, this quote unquote reformist president that that people at the time really thought, oh wow, he can bring some change, some moderation, and some freedom to to breathe. Um, and, and, and that then uh, led to more evolution of what hijab looks like in Iran right now. And, and you know what, I want the audience to know, listen, Iran is a country, if you go right now, women are wearing you know, colorful scarves, women are walking around the street, of course, right now, um, having the courage to even remove the scarves. But throughout the last 43 years, this uh, the, the, the women's wearing of hijab has changed and evolved. And I talk about this a lot in my book because for them, it was a way to express um, their desire for change, their desire for freedom and the desire to break free from the government's you know, oppressive mandates of telling people that you have to wear this. So, so that's that. And, and, and with regards to Massa's, Massa Amini's death, I mean, it was, it, was, it was just so tragic, right? But we also have to understand that she was unfortunately a victim of a morality police of a system that has been in place for, you know, years. Now, what really prompted this rage is that, like I said earlier, people have People no longer have anything to lose. People are tired. People are fatigued. Uh, people don't believe in this regime. People don't believe in this government. And their disillusionment is universal across the country, right? Um, and so this really, as someone said, was you know, uh, as if you throw a match uh, in a pile of, of, of dried leaves that have been sitting there ready to inflame, right? So yes, part of the Iranian uh, people's uh, frustration is with mandatory policies such as that of the hijab, which, by the way, as, as, as you mentioned and asked, has been sort of a pillar of the Islamic regime's ideology. You know, it's been one of those pillars of of the velayat of of this, you know, ideology of of uh, 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 of of the of the system of 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 the revolution that uh, that took on. Uh, that happened in 1979. But I also wanted to say that historically, again, something I talk about in my book and in the piece that I wrote for Time is that you know the issue of hijab has and, and also controlling women's bodies and controlling women's appearance has been an issue throughout history, Hagar. This is important to note that um, back in the 30s, in the late 30s, then Reza Shah, in an effort to sort of modernize um, Iran, uh, put a mandate and, and forcefully decided to ban women from wearing the hijab, the chador at the time. And you have to understand that at the time, you know, early 1900s and you know, uh, 100, 200 years prior, as a, as a, as a Muslim country, uh, women would wear the hijab. Women would decide to wear this, you know, uh, this uh, covering that for them um, was traditional. And of course, you know, some were religious, but, but as an example, you know, my own grandmother who comes from, who didn't come from a religious family at all, you know, in the late 1930s, um, his, his fa her family didn't um, see, didn't think that it's okay for her to go to school after Reza Shah banned the hijab just because they thought, oh, it defies tradition. And oh, how embarrassing would it be for a young girl to be on the street without the hijab? Do you see what I'm saying? So, so religion and 
controlling of women's bodies and um, and appearance has always been a tool by policymakers um, and you know those in government to um, you know to control women and 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 to push their agendas and and to push a narrative that defines their um, their regime, right? So I think it's important mm. to note that Iranian women historically, you know, over the past uh, decades and and hundreds of years, have always fought for their um, rights. Okay, and 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 right now we're seeing a, a generation that has evolved. Right now, the girls that we're seeing on the streets, th these are the most vibrant, educated, well-rounded individuals and generation of women inside the country who've seen their mothers, who've seen their grandmothers, who've read history, who know they deserve better, who know what they their rights are, and they're not going to settle, right? So, uh, pinning that thought, hijab is one prong. Of one of the of, of of the many issues that the Iranian people right now have um, uh, in opposition to the governing regime, but also women's rights historically have been what uh, generations have been fighting for, and and religion and you know women's appearance and controlling their bodies have always been used by you know mm -hmm. men usually in power uh, to you know to con control this very vibrant sector of the society. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if I may very briefly answer the. Um, uh, sort of first part of your question before we delved in hijab because I wrote it down is uh, you asked you know if there's a turning back I was speaking with a young woman actually an entrepreneur um, in Iran um, uh, and, and I asked her the same question I said do you think there's a turning back do you think things would be the same as it was before September 16 before Massa Amini's death uh, really shook the country and, and reminded once again uh, of, of the government's ignorance to human human life and and the dreams and and value of its uh people and society and she said you know this may not be the last episode but it certainly is the last season and so no mm -hmm. the iranian society would not be the same or would not ever be able to go back to what it was a couple of months ago and this movement will only continue until people have seen some tangible change because they've seen the blood that the people have shed they've seen the innocent lives that have been taken they see those uh who are with no reason and justification in prison and i don't think the iranians are going to uh this time at least let that go in vain and you know that's a perfect segue to the question i had in mind next which was what does this mean for the future of the regime I don't think that a lot of people are waiting with bated breath for the regime to collapse in the near future, at least. But as you said, and I completely agree with you, by the way, um, there is no turning back for the Iranian people. The hijab was what the and and Masa Amini's death. And so and for those of you who may not who may not be aware, Masa Amini, who, who was killed in police custody, uh, the custody of the morality police, um, was detained for allegedly improperly wearing her hijab and that's what sparked these protests and those protests obviously have led more to to calling against for the fall of the regime and against the ayatollah and against these clerics and against the regime altogether and the hijab is used as a method of controlling women in all ways by the way i've read a lot about how how you know you can't, as a woman, go into any kind of government building. You can't get anything that you need unless you're wearing that hijab, right? So it's like you said, I mean, hijab is a policy. Is it's a policy, yes. like and like other Islamic countries that strictly um, impose hijab. It, the Islamic regime has it as well. Now there are some uh, Muslim countries around the world who. You know, require it, but also allow others to not wear it. So it's a freedom to like Lebanon. Right. It's you the know? freedom. It's to have yes. the freedom to choose. Yes. Um, yes. It's not a statement in favor or no. against. It's just so that people can choose on their own will. And so my question to you then is, what does this all mean for the future of the Iranian regime? Do you think that they will try to make some small reforms that they believe will calm the protests and would that even work at this point um or do you think that this is them about to begin or embark on this kind of slow death absolutely i just, I just want to briefly uh touch on the you know just to finalize our our 
very important discussion on the issue of hijab. You know, Iran, uh, for those of you uh, who may not know much about the society, you know, is a country of 83, almost 84 million people from different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, uh, and, you know, quite frankly, different, different religious beliefs. And, and um, it's key to understand that in Iran right now, there are millions of women who believe in the virtue of their hijab, but vehemently detest the government's enforcement of, mm -hmm. this, of, of, of this practice. And in tandem, there are millions of women who would lose this headscarf in a heartbeat, but long for, you know, wish for the, for, for the choice to be theirs, for them to choose for their own uh, uh, bodies. And so I think this is critical. Hijab is a symbol of, of the regime's stifling of one's choice and, for, and, and, and force feeding of their version of what's right, of what's uh, virtuous, which by the way, we can talk about this, this can be a long discussion, um, is, it, it reflects the hypocrisy of, of the policymakers and the regime. Um, if I may share one anecdote, I'll be really quick because I'm being Very cognizant, we got cognizant, I know, yeah. cognizant of time. But I was in Iran covering the 2015 nuclear talks and we were interviewing a, um, uh, a former government official and he was looking for a photo for us in his iPad and he was just, you know, scrolling through and I was just, you know, fixing my scarf, just wanting to make sure that, you know, I'm appropriate. Um, and suddenly he came, he came across photos of his um, children's, uh, you know, parties and, you know, his son's wedding where no one was wearing this hijab. And again, I know this and quite frankly, everyone knows this. The frustration is that these people, the, the, the government officials and the regime that forces people to, you know, abide by their archaic and medieval policies, in fact, don't uh, abide by those rules, them, rules themselves. And this is evident in all aspects of the society, okay? From politics to, to uh, religious beliefs, uh, to the economy and, and so on. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. Um, but as far as you know, what this says about the, the regime, the Iranian regime, listen, um, I think the Iranian regime uh, unfortunately has, uh, has built a lot of influence and power um, domestically um, through its you know, perhaps most, uh, vile and, 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 and uh, deeply committed uh, uh, crusaders who are the Basij forces and the Sepah. And I actually have written a piece on this um, that will be out in Time Magazine this week. But you're talking about an apparatus that has so much control politically um, and also uh, militarily within the country and also um, its friends uh, in the region. Now, um, I'm very curious to, to kind of delve into why um, perhaps other countries who have previously been outspoken about the rogue behavior of the Iranian government are in many ways keeping quiet right now. I think the world is on standby to see what really would happen without have, you know, taking an active role in perhaps supporting the people in Iran, because I think much of it is they don't know what to do. Um, but I think one thing that we can be clear is that Iranian people or Iranian government has, has been weakened. And why we see that? Because of the brutal crackdown against protesters. Uh, because, you know, there were some leaked tapes uh, today that, that reflected how they worked with the media to push out false information, where in reality, they were working so hard around the clock to find ways to stifle and, and choke the, the protests. So, you know, if you don't have a government that's fearful and weak, you would not see the high numbers of prisoners and detainees and, and those killed on the street. So that just shows how the government is, uh, is, is afraid, how they're weak and how they're going to hold on to every last bit of power that they have. And also listen, they know that they're sanctioned. So many of these higher up um, individuals within the Iranian regime are sanctioned. So they really ha don't have many places to escape to. And I think, um, and I know we're gonna talk about this, uh, but they know they're also isolated. And that's also, I think, an element of fear um, that, that, that exists in, in the regime right now. But mind you that the, the Sepa and the Basij are quite powerful, they're ideologically charged, and they are trained to kill and be killed for the system 
uh, that uh, they so believe is righteous. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, it's what's interesting um, and unfortunately reminiscent for me, I handled Syria the first two years of the Syria crisis at the White House. And um, so that's 2011 and 2012. And I remember at the beginning of the Arab Spring when we saw protests that were also unprecedented and large and, and, and powerful, a lot of us had hope that, that either a, a leader would, coll would, would collapse, a regime would collapse, or that reforms, certain reforms would be made. And what we saw time and time again was the playbook of a dictator is to respond with this indiscriminate force because deep down they are fearful and desperate. And you see that with the Iranian regime getting more and more desperate, either because, not just because of the violence they're pursuing against their own people, but now it's it's going into the justice system where they're pursuing death sentences against protesters and where they seem to be trying to distract, at least this is my own analysis, where they seem to try to be distracting the world with other nefarious behavior, such as they um, have been threatening attacks against U.S. military bases in the region, and they've attacked an Israeli vessel in the Gulf of Oman, things of this kind, I mean. And so you, you sense this desperation, of course. However, it also doesn't necessarily mean, as you said, that they're on the verge of collapse. There's still a lot of power there and a lot of support and ideology. And so, but I want to expand on something you briefly mentioned, which is the response and sometimes silence from the international community. So what you've seen so far, at least from the United States, is uh, statements, a couple sta high level statements in support of the protesters. Uh, you saw some sanctions against those imposing of uh, pursuing violence. Um, you saw there were sanctions against the morality police, for example, um, and uh, and some sanctions that were withdrawn in order to support internet and technology in Iran. I don't know if they if they had an effect, but that that was their goal at least. And and from the international community, you've seen kind of similar statements of support. I find in Europe, you're you're definitely seeing much more coverage of it in Europe um, than you do in the United States, but you're not really seeing a lot of countries talk seriously at least, or at least not in the public, about cutting ties off with the Iranian government. Whereas during the Arab Spring, that was the natural next step. After a month or two of protests and indiscriminate violence, all governments, including the US Congress, but also around the world, would talk about, okay, at what point are we going to say, you know, we call on the leaders to step down and we're not gonna engage with them anymore. So my question to you is, what do you think about that? You know, do you think that that should be more in the, in the policy options among the international community? Would you, you know, do you think that that's an advisable policy step? Um, and if not, then what more would you like to see them doing or saying? How much time do we have? I know it's like a dissertation. <laughs> that's such a big topic. We can talk about it, uh, you know, for the rest of the discussion, Hagar. But I want to just briefly go through points. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, and you know, having spent much time in DC and having uh, interviewed many high-ranking American diplomats and uh, and officials, uh, we can be certain that you know, historically, the United States, in particular, if we're talking about the U.S., um, it, it has never really backed a movement, and and you would know this as well. Uh, you know, Americans have a tendency to back individuals and leaders. So we've never seen concrete policies and tangible strategies that would back, let's say, the people of this country or the people of that country, right? And, and with the case of Iran at the moment, there is no alternative leadership. Mind you that Iranians inside the country uh, don't want any sort of you know, foreign intervention or war or, you know, conflict, full scale conflict as they've seen in the neighborhood. Um, but they certainly see support. So with that said, um, the more the international community, especially the United States, puts pressure on isolating the regime and the regime insiders whilst amplifying the voices of Iranians inside the country, I think that's first step, right? But um, uh, as far as concrete ways of uh, demanding the stepping down of the regime and the Ayatollahs, again, you, you, you know more on international law than I, but I don't think historically we've seen such 
uh, sort of demands unless there is an alternative leadership that the United States and the international community is backing to replace that establishment. Um, that, you know, that's what we saw, for instance, in the case of Egypt. And, you know, I want to bring up Syria right now. I mean, look at Syria. The country is torn apart. Millions of people are forced to flee their homes. I mean, I covered the conflict in Syria and Iraq as well. But look, uh, Assad is, you know, slowly re-emerging uh, uh, within the Arab world and, and sort of trying to reclaim his seat. So, um, you know, we, we have to look at history and how um, and what that teaches us. But as far as tangible steps, I think, um, you know, we just saw at the United Nations last week, they're putting an, a, weapon, a mechanism in place to account for human rights violations in Iran, which, by the way, obviously the, the regime in, in, in Tehran, uh, you know, disregarded. Uh, but of course, I think that's a historic step, as uh, both the White House and the State Department said earlier this week. Um, again, the United Nations tend to uh, work a bit slowly, but I think in this case, they did pretty well. And on December 14, for those who are following this, um, you know, these unprecedented protests in Iran, um, another meeting is taking place uh, that would essentially decide the faith of Iran being on the Council on Women's Rights, which is yeah. quite absurd, by the way. They and they have been on this council for years. And, you know, this is, um, this is to remove them from this council, because quite frankly, um, you know, they're, they're no one to have, have, any say on women's rights uh, based on the track record that, that, we, that we're seeing. But also, listen, I think Europe has, has done pretty well. Um, last week, we saw the European Parliament severing all ties with Iranian officials and, and uh, uh, announcing that they're, they're, they are not going to have any engagement with Iran, right? That's the European Parliament. Now, I do believe that Canada, for instance, and also the United States, um, who are home to so many government, for, former government officials, those who have essentially brought much assets by way of money laundering um, uh, to their countries, uh, they, they have an opportunity to kick them out, uh, block their assets, freeze their assets, in many ways do what they did to Russia, uh, target individuals who have assets and influence abroad, but also in the country. Um, I think, uh, you know, severing ties is key, but of course the United States does not have any diplomatic ties with Iran to begin with, but there are so many um, children and sort of former government officials um, in the United States, in Canada, in England. I mean, right now I live in London and, and I, you know, you cannot step outside without seeing you know, these young kids flaunting their money who you know, Hagar, that, that you know, their dads are uh, part of the regime. Why? Why? They need to all be expelled. The, the assets need to be frozen. Individually, they need to be targeted and also systematically on a global front. There, there should be no engagement. And, you know, we, we briefly talked before the chat started about the nuclear talk. Of course, a few weeks after the, um, the, the unfortunate death of Mahsa Amini, um, the State Department announced that there would not be any uh, discussion of the JCPOA. But, you know, on the background, yeah, still is somehow, you know, in the conversation. But but that should, you know, that should be off the table. There should be no engagement with Iran whatsoever unless matters are resolved systematically and in and and, and tangibly for the people. But again, listen, I want to just uh, end the thought by saying that Iranian people, again, the millions that we're talking about, they know better. Uh, they know that this system and this regime cannot be. Um, cannot be cleansed. You know, they are so disillusioned. There's, there was a time um, during the, you know, the presidency of Khatami or even, you know, the first term of Rouhani, the people were excited. They believed in the reformist and moderate voices, right? But, but those voices have been so marginalized and at times proven to be completely incompetent and by the way, corrupt. Yeah. So um, it's just, it's just very sad to, uh, to satisfy a nation that has been so disillusioned, so broken, and so disregarded from all fronts. You know, that's, I'm gonna take a, one question. I'm gonna insert this um, from the audience into our discussion now because it ties to the question we were just talking about, which is how much influence do you think these multilateral diplomatic levers? So all the things you just mentioned, right? Taking the JCPOA discussion off the table. Um, 
sanctioning more individuals who are clearly benefiting from from the regime or have these assets that are of people who support the regime that have stashed these assets abroad, seizing those, um, freezing them and potentially seizing them. Um, how much do you think those multilateral diplomatic levers will actually have um, an influence on Iranian policy moving forward? Do you think they'll have an effect? I think if they're systematic, if they're cohesive, and if they're strong, listen, sanctioning the SEPA, mm -hmm. okay, I mean, it's all great and dandy, right? But yeah. what does that do on yes. the ground yeah. when these guys are shooting against their people? Yeah. Right? But when you isolate a regime in its entirety, as done previously, you know, in the case of Russia, to an extent, that can have impact. But, 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 but it can... But it's twofold. Number one, it sends a strong signal that there's no to tolerance for this behavior. Number two, it shows that the Iranian people are seen and their voices are heard. You know, Hagar, one of the one of the most common things that Syrians have told me you know, over the course of the last ten years is that we 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 just feel that we were not heard. Mm -hmm. We just we just felt that you know no one listened to us, right? And 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 that shouldn't be the case of Iran because Iranians are longing to belong to the international community mm -hmm. and they know their rights. They want to belong to a community of, of people who uh, share so much more in common with them than they ever know. And so I think that the, the global response to Iran and the regime's behavior toward its people and citizens should be cohesive, should be strong um, and, and should move beyond talking points and, you know, publicity stunts and, and, and PR um, campaigns. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, that's, it's a, it's a good point that I really wanted to make sure we raise. And by the way, before I continue, again, a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat and I'll make sure to incorporate them in the discussion. Um, but Tara, it's, it's, do you think right now at least, and, and things, as I know from handling Syria, they, they ebb and flow in terms of how much the people feel felt and heard and seen, um, how do the Iranian people, how, from what you know, from, from your discussions, from your connections back there, do they feel that the international community is supporting them enough? And what would they like to see from regular people who who want to support them, right? Not I, government policy is, is as you know, uh, bureaucratic and arduous and long, and it can take time, especially when you're talking about ceasing um, ceasing discussions with the, with the government. But how, what is the discussion in term from the people um, that you hear that you find very interesting or fascinating that we might all be interested in hearing about, about how they feel and about what's going on, about the international community response and how can those who want to support them more do that? Great question. Um, I, was spoke, I was speaking with a friend um, who works within the sort of medical uh, equipment industry and uh, he, he uh, a few weeks ago went to Germany for a conference from Iran and I had a chat with him um, and he said, Tara, uh, I've been coming to this conference uh, for many years, but this is the first time that people from all over the world you know, parts of Latin America, Asia, you know, African nations, North America, they come up to me and say, oh, you know, you're from Iran. We're thinking about you. Mm -hmm. Our hearts are with your people. And that's important, Hagar. For 43 years, the only narrative on Iran and the only story on Iranian people has been told through a monolithic, rogue, and dark lens. And that is the government of it. Okay, mm -hmm. Iranians in their entirety haven't had the opportunity to tell their stories. And that's what I spent my entire career trying to do, to tell stories of people from their vantage point of how their lives are being affected by whatever it is that is affecting them. And the power of human voices and humanized storytelling. And I really, really hope that those watching uh, do not take this loosely. The more people know about one another, the more they understand of what they have in common with each other. And that's when an opportunity can be created for discourse, for engagement. And Iranian people are some of the most pro-Americans yeah. in the world, but also they are wise, they are incredibly educated, and they know that countries 
don't have friends, the countries that have interests. They understand that no government, no foreign government feels sorry for them or you know, wanna, wanna help them. They understand that they're living in an incredibly rich country, a diversified country, that anyone always and that that everyone always throughout history wanted a part of it, a piece of it, and they're very well aware of that. That's why I want to emphasize on the power of human to human, people to people engagement, and that comes to your question about what 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 Iranian people want the world to 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 know is that they want them to know that their hopes, their dreams, their their aspirations are are just like them, that they don't have any difference in what they want in life than what you and I have. And Iranians are, again, like I said, some of the most vibrant, educated uh, populations in the entire region. They are, for God's sake, some of the highest number, the, the highest number of internet users in the Middle East, despite filtering, perpetual filtering of the internet. And, and the women, we talked about women in the issue of hijab. Again, women make up the, 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 the highest percentage of college graduates in Iran. They have a vibrant presence in all sectors of the society. Again, despite all the restrictions. And what does this tell us? Mm -hmm. This tells us of the potential and the capacity that exists in that country. And I think at this moment, there's nothing more important to continue these uh, engagements, these people to people conversations for the world, for our American friends, those in, the, in, you know, in North America, Europe, around the world, to see Iran and Iranians through the lens of its people not the government. Iran is a country made up of 83 million ordinary human beings, not 83 nuclear heads. And, mm -hmm. and, and there is a distinction in that. And, yeah. and for, for four decades, the world was, was told and trained to fear Iran without knowing its people. And I think the more we focus on people and what they want and their stories and, and their common grounds and similarities to, to, uh, with us, we can find ways to engage again, maybe not tomorrow, but but in long term policy making. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, before we close, we're wrapping up, and so but I would be remiss if we close without talking about the World Cup, and what we've seen there in terms of both the some actions of the Iranian soccer team itself, which refused to sing the national anthem. And you've obviously seen many of Iranian soccer fans uh, protesting uh, at the same time. And, and if, if in my, and there have been, this World Cup has just been remarkably peppered with protests. And as, as someone who focuses very heavily on human rights, for me, I find it's very exciting. But I would argue that the Iranian well, both the, the Iranian protests and the LGBTQ plus protests have been incredibly inspiring and, and some of the loudest. And you even had, obviously, one of the, the biggest ones just now was somebody who rushed the field, I think it was yesterday, um, with a jersey that said, oh woman, life, liberty. And, and he was holding a flag that, that uh, had the LGBTQ plus colors. And so I, would, I wanna ask you, you know, are you surprised by what you're seeing? And what do you think will come of it? What do you think this means? And um, all, and also, is the Iranian soccer team in danger of returning now that they've kind of made this statement? Any thoughts you have in general about what you're seeing at the World Cup and how it makes you feel? Sure. We have two minutes. So I tried to sum it up uh, in the, in that short time. But also, the 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 person you mentioned uh, had uh, a few words on Ukraine as well in the front of his shirt. But, mm. but a few a few points. Listen, Iran has uh, pardon football has historically for Iran and Iranians been one of the few sources of joy that that united people and also allowed them to to join the international community. And for those of you who are interested, I have a short explainer on my social media channels on Instagram that they give you the history and background and context of this. Um, so football has always been more than a game for Iranians. It was, a, it was an opportunity for them to um, be seen on the international stage. And this is uh, unfortunately uh, coming at a time that um, the national team has been torn by, uh, by the regime's propaganda and, and, and unfortunately, uh, in many ways, affected by the ongoing protests in Iran. Now, sources have told me, those very close to the national team last week, uh, that um, the, uh, the players were threatened. Uh, they had to sign guarantees and they, um, they had to essentially give the, their guarantee that they're not going to show any form of, uh, you know, public 
uh, dissent against the regime. And mind you, I want to also say this, that the Iranian regime and the Qatari um, uh, you know, regime have very close ties in a sense that um, in, a, in a call yesterday, actually, the Iranian president thanked the Emir of Qatar uh, mm. for upholding values, uh, you know, Islamic values. And so, you know, the, the government of Qatar is, is very much holding the interests of the Iranian government. But, but as far as the Iranian players go, they're caught in the middle. Uh, they, they didn't sing the national anthem in the first game, but in the second, they, they did. But you could tell that they don't want to. Again, bear in mind that these kids are just like those we see on the streets. Uh, in fact, one of the star football players was arrested. And I think that mm -hmm. was to show a signal to sign that, hey, don't cross the line, behave. Otherwise, your families would be next. And, and by the way, he was uh, released today, earlier this morning, Voria Afuri. And so um, uh, the, the, the players are, are walking a fine line. Uh, but, but again, football has always been um, an opportunity for people of Iran to come together and also connect with the world. And, and this match with the United States uh, it, it, it is one that... Um, you know, would be no different than, than the last match that we saw in 1998 between Iran and the United States, where Iranians were longing to, to connect with their American counterparts. But this comes against a backdrop of, of severe uh, government crackdown and an ongoing brutality against the people. Well, Tara, thank you so much for that insight. It's just, it's remarkable. Hani, I'm gonna kick it to you. I was so, I feel so lucky to have had this conversation on, on this important topic. Thank you so much, Hagar. And I would echo your gratitude to Tara and her, her insight and um, unique perspectives here that provide a lot of depth and um, awareness building that I think it's so critical. Um, one thing that I think was apparent throughout the entirety of this conversation is we may use words like Iranian, but at the end of the day, this is an amalgamation of unique individuals, individuals, humans, um, and there is no monolithic anything anywhere. And I think that's so important to remember that um, the more we humanize individuals and think through the daily impacts that any policy can have on anyone, um, the better we are at designing um, constructive ways forward and not losing the importance or the, the kind of the deeper meaning behind all of this. So thank you, Tara, for bringing that um, forth through all your remarks. I encourage folks to check out the resources that were dropped into the chat or um, the primer that was referenced and to kind of, of course, stay um, attuned to this important um, moment, not only for Iran, but for um, the future of the region and, of course, U.S.-Iranian uh, ties. So thank you um, to our two experts for this conversation. Thank you to my colleagues at Concordia for putting this together and, of course, to our audience for joining in and sharing these. As always, you can use hashtag Concordia22 to advance conversations. Reach out to our team, memberships at concordia.net to learn more about how to get involved. And this is certainly a conversation that will be continuing. Thank you, everyone, and have a really great day.